On the program today, author, entrepreneur, podcaster, and the face of Draft to Digital, Kevin Tumlinson is my guest, coming up. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, man, thanks for having me on. Man, this is, I'll tell you this what. This is like deja vu. You know what? Didn't I talk to you like two days ago? But it <laughs> was kind of switched around. You were exactly. the one uh, asking the inane questions, and I was the one making up the uh, bullshit answers. What we're going to have to do <laughs> is we're going to have to take our, uh, our, our mutual respective windows and, and invert them, flip them, so that we're yeah. not. Yeah, well, I think what we do is maybe if we combine both interviews into one, we have four windows of us <laughs> all talking. One big bonus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, I exactly. uh, appreciate you taking time out. I know you're super busy. You are a new friend of mine. And uh, you remind me a lot of myself, uh, you're a younger, uh, better looking version maybe, but uh, you're, <laughs> you got a lot of irons in the fire. You're an author, do, you're an entrepreneur, you're a podcaster, you're a video caster. Uh, you do uh, the marketing stuff for draft to digital. Uh, yeah. Did I leave anything out? Uh, I, I, it's quite a few things, but it's cool. It's do you cool. sleep in there anywhere? <laughs> no, you would think I would do that, but long ago I had to purge myself of that nasty habit. And, yeah, uh, highly yeah. overrated sleep. The trick is, I learned this from an old episode of Night Court. You, it's really all about keeping the rapid eye movement. <laughs> <laughs> is it, is, as long as something's moving, it's okay, huh? That's pretty right, good. Man. Well, uh, I'm gonna. I want to just kind of go down the list because, uh, again, you are you're kind of doing everything. You're writing, yeah. you're marketing, you're working with other authors. Uh, you've got one of my my favorite podcasts on the topic of uh, authorship, uh, Word Slinger. Uh, you're also in with, uh, as I said, Draft the Digital. So, uh, yeah. really quickly, we'll just start at the top and and go down because the folks on this show primarily are interested in all of that stuff. Good. Yeah, so uh, let's let's start with the writing. Give me uh, give me a little background. How did you get into writing books? And uh, tell me about the books you've got out there. Man, I've been writing. Uh, I I joke all the time and tell people that I my first I wrote my first book when I was five years old. Uh, and See, it that's was, not a joke with me. And my mom still. I'm has telling it. you, dude. And I don't have it anymore because I. And there's a whole tragic story behind why I don't <laughs> have it anymore. But I I wrote it. It was like five pages on notebook paper. You know, one of those big chief tablets. You know, mm -hmm. and I gave it to my stepfather. Uh, uh, he, he said, I'll take it to work and I'll type it up. And, you know, a week or so later, he asked if I was still interested in that. And out of a, a fit of uh, modesty, I'm like, ah, you can throw that away if you want, you know? <laughs> which he totally did. So I haven't been modest since. But uh, writing became, you know, writing was uh, writing and storytelling. Those were things that were always part of my DNA. I, uh, I started writing professionally at 12, started getting paid for it. Um, now, who paid you at 12 to write? Uh, local papers. I was doing a kind of team beat thing. Um, Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Wild Peach, Texas. And if you've heard Texas, of it, it means you're Texas, from another there. Southern boy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. In fact, we're getting ready to uh, Texas. We're we're going to have a big tropical story. A uh, category three hurricane at this point. That's right. Are you in Austin or? Where? I'm in the. Uh, I'm just out of, outside of Houston. Okay. Are you going to have to evacuate? I don't know. Um, maybe. Well, I kind of wish I had my RV back. Yeah. My RV's in, in for um, maintenance and repairs. So if we evacuate, it's going to be hoofing it. In the, that's, uh, that's one of the cool things about you. I was doing some research on you, and I went back and found a bunch of old videos of you doing your podcast from in your RV. And, right, right. You know, what, a, what a great – so anyway, you started writing professionally at 12, and then where? Right. Um, you know, I carried that through to – through high school and college, uh, wrote for newspapers and magazines and, uh, got into copywriting. Um, that became my main career for, for a couple of decades, uh, doing uh, marketing copywriting and, uh, anything related to that. And, uh, you know, somewhere along the way, I mean, I always wanted to write books. I wrote short stories. I wrote a couple of, uh, what I call my first thirds, uh, which, <laughs> you know, first third of a book I wrote, I had a few hundred of those laying around and, yeah. I had friends who really encouraged me uh, to do that. My grandmother was very encouraging to me. She wanted me to do that. She put me through the uh, Writer's Digest School, which I thought was kind of That was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, it's, it's changed quite a bit from when I went through it. I, you know, yeah. I don't know how they do it exactly now, but I had a, a published author as a mentor. Um, and, you know, I would submit short stories, and she would critique them and tell me what I could do different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a great experience, really. But, you know, through that, I didn't do as much of that kind of writing as I really wanted to. I had this attitude of, you know, I'm going to go. I did a whole bunch of, you and I both, we worked in television and film. Yep. Uh, 
you know, I did that. I had a, I had my own little production company for a while. Um, I've done web development. I've done, in, I was an engineer for a while. I've done a little bit of everything. You have uh, a degree? I have several degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you go to school? I went, uh, among others, I went to Houston Baptist University uh, here in Houston. Um, it's a double major school. So I got, that was my second round of college. I had gone and gotten a uh, engineering degree uh, through a school tied to the UH system. Uh, but HPU, I went back and got, you know, a degree in literature, a degree in uh, uh, communications, and uh, went on to a master's in education from that program, which wow, look at I you. think you I don't am. look educated. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah, no, these are, and these were good. These were good uh, training grounds for me. Mm-hmm. I, I entered some contests, some uh, writing contests. You know, HBU has a pretty decent creative writing program. Mm-hmm. U of H has the, like the number three creative writing program in the country or in the world, actually. Um, and I, I kind of linked up. To, with those guys for a bit, uh, won a couple of competitions, got some money for it. You know, I didn't really start writing and publishing books until much later. 2008 was my first self-published book coming off of a, uh, a contract I had with a publisher. Uh, and that contract did not work favorably for me. So <laughs> <laughs> I, started, I started looking into the idea of indie publishing and mm-hmm. just fell in love with it. And I've been doing that ever since. Started, started life as a sci-fi writer, by the way. So, is that, is that funny? What, what was your first book that you wrote and uh, self-published? I, uh, I wrote a book called Citadel First Colony. It was the first in a trilogy of books. Um, there's a, a history, a little bit of history behind that book just because we were going to develop it as a uh, web series, a uh, television series on, online. Well, it would have been one of the first at that time, you know. Back in the day, as they back say. Back in the day when it was all early. We were, we were trying to figure out, like, the best way to release it. Uh, but I, I kind of had this, this idea that it would do better if I had a book tied to it, you know. Mm-hmm. So I wrote the book, and uh, I foolishly put book one of three on the first one, and, uh, <laughs> and that sealed my fate, yeah. <laughs> So I had to write two more and uh, it took me quite a bit of time to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I spent the next six, six years basically writing that those three books. And then all of a sudden had this epiphany um, at a, uh, I was at a conference, had this epiphany that if I wanted to do this full time, if I wanted to be a writer full time, I can't mm-hmm. write a book every two years. Um, I got to start figuring it out. And I, yeah. I came up with a whole process, what I call my 30 day author process. I wrote a book about it and everything. And, uh, I just have a, you know, it's an ass and seat kind of thing, you know, Yeah. sit down and set your word count and write. And I've been churning books out ever since, man. That's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. Cause you, you and I, we've, we've gotten to be, you know, pretty good pals here and we talk a lot offline, but yeah, there, man. there seems to be a formula now with a lot of these guys. Like, you know, we, we, we talk about Anderley and the Dave Wood yeah. and uh, some of the others where, uh, and, and I think sci-fi tends to be a good genre to start this in sci-fi paranormalish kind of stuff yeah. where you really are cranking out a book every three or four weeks. I mean, Russell right. Blake, when I, I talked to Russell and he was telling me that he tries to publish, he did like 28 books in a year, just, yeah. just a crazy number of books. But the theory there is uh, if you have that many books and you get an audience, they're going to buy every book and then come back to your your backlog is that is that kind of the theory you're going under these days are you uh yeah, are you planning no. on doing anything like that well I, yeah more or less i mean I, so i had a kind of change in genre uh, a couple about a year or two ago a year mm-hmm. ago now um, um away from of, sci-fi yeah 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 a good buddy of mine is a thriller author we had a podcast together he, he dared me on air to write a thriller and uh <laughs> i wrote one and you know, I'd been doing pretty okay with my sci-fi and fantasy stuff, uh, but not really blowing up the way I wanted to. And right. uh, this one-off, it was supposed to be a one-off thing that, you know, I was i was just doing as a gag and it ended up being a bestseller and winning an award and making me a bunch of money. And oh, wow. And now, which, it, which book was that? That was the Quelo Medallion or Coelho Medallion as some people <laughs> Now that was that the first Dan Kotler book? That was the first one. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about Dan Kotler because he's a. Uh, how how would you describe him? Talk a little bit about those those books. That first one. It's a very um, the 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 series is very much in line with like a Dan Brown, uh, Stieg Larsson kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the protagonist is he's not 
necessarily an action hero. It gets compared to Indiana Jones a lot. I think it's because he's an archaeologist. Uh, he's like an anthropologist slash quantum physicist. You know? How did you come uh, up with this character? Were you, were you interested in archaeology? Or? I am. I have a huge interest in anthropology in, in particular. Um, mm -hmm. I read a ton of books on this topic. I, I talk to people. I watch programs. Um, quantum physics was always a big love of mine, too. And I, I always thought there was an interesting marriage between those two because they really are both about – the archaeology and quantum physics are really all about figuring out why things are the way they are, mm -hmm. why are cultures the way they are. Um, the the um, the character Dan Kotler, uh, he's not just an anthropologist. I mean, he's he's a stu he's a student of humanity. I mean, he he is um, very big on um, psych. You know, he he understands psychology. He understands body language. He's very proficient with that. Uh, so you know, and he's seen some action in his day. Um, but he's kind of like, in a way, like uh, Da Vinci Code's um, uh, Robert Langdon. He's mm -hmm. a little bit like. That more more brains than brawn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although he he desperately wants to be brawny, but uh, <laughs> uh, he's he's formed an association with the FBI, and they're a little leery about giving him weapons. <laughs> <laughs> so he he's more of a Langdon than like a Jack Reacher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that we talk to the same audiences in general, but if you're if you're tuning into a Jack Reacher book, you know, because you want to see him kick ass and you know uh, save the day with his well, his might and muscle. Uh, yeah. He's the people. only guy that can take a 45 in the chest and it not penetrate the muscle. Well, <laughs> that's pretty good. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, in those stories, I mean, I love those stories too. So there is mm -hmm. an element of that in my books. Um, these, these are meant, they're not meant to be sort of high action um, thrillers. Uh, right. Although I, there's plenty of action in them. Mm -hmm. uh, people love the pace of these things. They're very fast paced. Um, but the, the real, gems for me like when i was writing sci-fi i always told people because you would tell someone i write sci-fi and they're like i don't read sci-fi oh i don't i don't <laughs> yeah. do sci-fi you know it's, isn't it funny how many out of star wars you well know? isn't it funny how many people <laughs> don't read sci-fi yet sci-fi is like the number one genre for readers right exactly who's reading this stuff but it's hard to convince people because they think it's all, all robots aliens yeah. and spaceships yeah. and I kept telling people, I kept saying that, um, you know, I'm a character writer. I, when I write a book, it's, it's all about the characters. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, you could take any of those characters and pull them out of sci-fi and drop them in any other setting and the story would be the same. And right. this was an opportunity to put my money where my mouth was and uh, do something fun. And uh, it worked out very well. And it, it, it took me a full year to come around to the idea that I was a thriller author now. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> why, why did it take you so long to reconcile that? I think part of it is I grew up with sci-fi. I love sci-fi. This is the whole reason I started writing uh, mm -hmm. stories. Um, Orson Scott Card was my mm -hmm. sort of personal hero, you know, uh, in, in literature. Um, I emulate him, you know, all the time. And people have commented that, you know, reading one of my books is very similar to reading one of his mm -hmm. books um, in style. You That's know. a high compliment, too. I'll take it. Yeah, um, hell yeah. You know, uh, it's one of the better ones I've gotten. And <laughs> <laughs> I've had some comparisons and not quite as favorable. Yeah. But, you know, I... So I, I, I had a tendency to want to stick to it because that's, you know, dance with the one who brung you, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I... The realizations I came to... It took me a while to, to, to really come around to this because it was sort of like swimming away from the shore, you know? I always kind of kept it in, in sight just in case I wanted to go back. Yeah. Never quite clicking to if I just pressed on just a little, I'd see the other side. And uh, when I, the, the sort of pivot point for me really was when I went to the Nebula Awards. And this is like sci-fi writer mecca, you mm -hmm. know? The Nebulas and the Hugos, those are... I, I love going to these shows. Uh, I love talking to the authors. I love, you know, I speak at these shows and um, I was having conversations with a lot of sci-fi authors. I discovered a lot of great new work, really enjoyed the experience, but realized that when it came to talking about my own stuff, I was just not interested in, in doing it. Like mm -hmm. I didn't want to talk about Citadel. You know, those, those, those boats were, had left the harbor. <laughs> yep. You know? Yep. And, uh, I found myself wanting to talk about Dan Kotler and then watching these guys who, you know, guys and gals who love spaceships and aliens and robots, their eyes start to glaze over in the same yeah. way. <laughs> 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 that, 
you know the norms right. about sci-fi you get you get that expression you know and uh i realized you know what this is where my heart is i love telling yeah. these stories i love yeah. the thriller genre it's very flexible and it's it's very open there were new challenges for me so that was the last draw for me i i I severed ties. I stopped referring to myself. I had called myself a speculative fiction author for a while um, because it was easier on the ears than sci-fi author. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) I sort of just picked up and decided, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to leap in. I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to burn the boats and leave the shore. I am a thriller author now. So the, you know, the first step to overcoming a problem is admitting you have a problem. So can't Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm a thriller author. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many books are you in the, Dan, in the uh, Kotler series? So I'm three full-length novels in and one uh, novella. I've got another full-length novel on the board right now. I already, I already finished it up. I'm kind of going back and doing a little rewrite because uh, I changed a, a major detail. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll be finishing that up probably within a month. And, and um, is the, uh, the series successful? Is the, the first book? Has oh, it continued? Yeah. No. I, uh, so I, I saw kind of a dip when I... I, uh, because I'm switching genres, I'm basically starting from ground zero again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I've been, uh, I, when I now on my show, I give advice to authors and I, when I talk to, I, I do some consulting, you know, and coaching. And, uh, so some of the advice I give authors is, you know, if you're starting out fresh and you only have like one to three books, you might consider going exclusive. That sounds very counter to anything I would tell you normally. I'm all about going wide. Of you course. mean going exclusive to Amazon? To uh, like Amazon and KDP Select, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's a, it's a good way to build a platform, make a little extra money, and right. you know, um, kind of shore yourself up, get yourself ready. And then uh, over time, you would release books into the wider ecosystem. So, uh, I decided I needed to do that with these because I didn't have the platform. Uh, I had a platform for sci-fi and it was great. And there's a lot of crossover. You know, I got nearly 30,000 people on my mailing list and mm. a lot of them will buy those books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But um, I didn't spend the kind, that kind of time building a, a thriller audience. So it's been a little bit of a relaunch. They're doing great. Yeah. You know, doing pretty okay. Uh, I think, um, so I pulled those back, put them exclusive, uh, and as their 90-day periods end, I'm going to evaluate, you know, see where I'm at, and mm-hmm. start over time. I'll start going wide with them. And so, uh, so you pulled you pulled them off of all the other platforms, and you enrolled them in KDP Select, right. and and that's where they are. And uh, boy, that's just a, those, just the thrillers, just I mean, the thrillers. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting because you, you have 30,000 people on a sci-fi list. That doesn't mean you can sell them mysteries. Readers can be really rabid. They about can. that sort yeah. of thing there, yeah. there is enough crossover that it's it's been okay yeah so like have you have uh, you thought about it is there any interest at all at having kotler kind of dabble in that through his work somehow so i, I do throw in some elements of sci-fi in these books so there there is the potential and a lot of my readers have kind of come to expect that from me mm-hmm. in um some of my sci-fi uh, i wrote a paranormal thriller called evergreen that has been wildly popular with my readers and uh, it's got that sort of supernatural element. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And every book I write is in the same, we're going to just call it an omniverse. Um, It's in this, it's all connected. It's a bit like Stephen King, your hero and your in the background there. Uh, It's just a nice screensaver. (laughs) (laughs) As his dark tower, you Mm -hmm. know, gunslinger Mm -hmm. universe that ties everything else he writes together. I have uh, my Sawyer Jackson books tie every single book I write together in the same uh, multiverse, you know? Right. Um, so there are Easter eggs. I plant Easter eggs in everything I write. There's yeah. always something that ties back to at least one other book. So. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, on all these new worlds that are coming out? I mentioned Anderley earlier and yeah. uh, uh, Dave Wood and, and folks like that. Not just, you know, they, they have the Kindle worlds, but now they're creating their own worlds that other mm-hmm. authors can come in and, and write in and collaborate. And, you know, in, in my mind, that seems like a pretty good way for an author to, to at least break through. If right. you can, if you can uh, put your name on a book with a Michael Anderley or a Craig Martell or a Martha Carr or someone like that, uh, it's a good way to get your, your toe in the door at least. You know, you're going to share yeah. the profits, but, you know, darn, it's, it's probably easier than trying to do it all yourself because you and I both know how hard that is. Yeah, I think, uh, honestly, I think it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, profound things about 
the indie author community is is the the sort of overwhelming and overpowering sense to give back. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Lee is an, an incredible example of that. He's mm-hmm. built this world that he shares. I've I've literally watched mm-hmm. him launch the careers of an, of a number of authors now. Um, I think it's a fantastic thing. I yeah. I think it's what we were meant to build personally. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I would I've considered opening. And I'm not just considering it. I, I will. I, I'll just make the announcement here. I mean, I'll I would definitely open up like my Citadel universe, my my Sawyer Jackson books, even Dan Kotler, uh, although, you know, it's a little harder with that, that set of characters. Um, but I'm, I'm, I love the idea. Mm-hmm. You're empowering people to, to go out and build careers. Um, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah, I think well, I, we're going to see a lot more of it. Yeah, I, I think we will too. And I'm, I really like it. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out which world I want to want to write in but yeah. uh you know if if folks out there if you don't know what we're talking about basically what the way it happens is you have an author in, in this case like a michael anderley who has had i mean just crazy outrageous runaway success relatively yeah. quickly as the timeline goes but now he's he's sharing that success because he is partnering with other writers to write in his world mm-hmm. uh, which is pri- very much sci-fi parent he's kind of a mishmash Right. Uh, Steve Conkley is the same way. He does like uh, uh, seal books and that sort of thing. So right. uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of of world building and then sharing the wealth. And you're right. I think Andrew Lee is one of the got the nicest guys I've met. A lot of these guys they hit it to that level and they're like, see ya. You know yeah, what I mean? They're, exactly. So right. uh, well, so so the writing is going good. What are you working on right now? I am uh, I'm working on the uh, fourth Dan Kotler book, and uh, it's going to be called The Girl in the Mayan Tomb. Ooh. Uh, I've got the cover already uh, mocked up and everything, and it's 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 going to be pretty cool, man. I'm excited about it. I I, I do not run out of story ideas for this. <laughs> I, I'm constantly coming. Across what's uh, what's the word count on these books? Oh, I typically hit. Uh, I, I like to aim for between sixty and seventy thousand. Actually, okay. I, 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 to me, they're a comfortable read. And uh, some people complain that they're they're a little short. Some people, you know, don't notice at all. Yeah. Um, I know that thrillers typically at the hundred to 120 range most of the time, but I, for me, I felt I like my pacing to be re- very fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I want you to, I want you to finish that book wishing there were more of it. Yeah. Uh, that's part of my marketing strategy, really. <laughs> that's, it's a really good point because a lot of, I think the thrillers typically 80 to a hundred thousand words is typically the sweet spot for thrillers. Mm-hmm. But if a lot of those 80,000 words are what I call packing peanuts, you know, right, they're just exactly. words thrown in there that don't do anything for the story. They're just there to fluff it out. I'd rather not have those words. I personally like 60,000 as a link because I yeah, can get I through do. a 60,000 word book relatively quick. Right. And, I, you know, I think you and I have actually talked about this uh, maybe on, on my show. But, you know, you're your first reader, you know, you're the first reader you mm-hmm. have to impress. And uh, to me, um, when I when I sit down to read one of these books, you know, I it's a little dismaying and disheartening to, to get halfway through a book and realize that, you know, it took you three months to get there, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I, uh, you know, I don't want to spend most of my year reading three books. I want right. to be able to read a whole bunch of them over the weekend. You know? Yeah. Did you ever read the stand speaking to Stephen yes. King? How long did that take you? Uh, you know, back in those days when I had a lot more free time, yeah. I, mean, I probably read it in like a week and <laughs> I read it that. took me about three years, man. I just kept coming because <laughs> I'm, I'm what they call a bathroom reader. I read while I'm in the bathroom. So, you right, know, same. three, four pages. <laughs> I, read the room. Yeah. I read that. I read uh, Battlefield Earth, which is also a tome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, um, despite its roots, its or um, connection with uh, a certain uh, organization that I won't name, uh, I really <laughs> found that book influential, influential on my writing, too. Yeah. So. Great, great book. Lousy movie. Lousy, but great book. Terrible, horrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kevin, let's talk now about uh, the podcast, the Word yeah. Slinger podcast, which in my humble opinion, not blowing smoke up your backside, but I, I think that's one of the, the best podcasts that I listen to on the topic of writing because you're, you, you have a lot of really cool guests. I'm, I've, I've got guest envy going here dude but this is uh, how i feel by the way in reverse so don't feel envy like well, i looking through your back catalog i'm like 
I mean, you know, what are you going to do when David Baldacci <laughs> calls? What are you, you know, but uh, tell me, let's talk a little bit about the podcast. How did you yeah. get started doing that? Man, I, um, back when I uh, decided I was going to jump into this with both feet and really make a career out of writing books for a living, um, I started looking for any resources I could find. And, uh, you know, podcasting was still somewhat unknown. I mean, mm -hmm. at least to me, I, I felt like I had heard of it, but hadn't really experienced it. Um, didn't know anybody else who listened to them. And I started looking at uh, the various podcasts. The self-publishing podcast was, of course, one of the first you find. Yeah. Those guys just just killed it with the name of the thing. Yeah, that was a good and, one, uh, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> makes life a little easier. So yeah. I was listening to a ton of these. And I think every single writer who uh, starts listening to podcasts eventually starts a podcast. And it's just sort of a rule. Um, I actually lucked out. I connected with Nick Thacker, the guy, the same guy who, who dared me to write this thriller. Uh, and he had a podcast, the self-publishing answers podcast on a whim. I mean, I, I we had, uh, connected, we'd been talking, he liked my stuff. We were hitting it off and I said, Hey man, if you ever want to, you know, a, a get a, uh, second host on your show, just let me know. And that Friday we started. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I, I was doing that and I realized, you know, I love the, what we're doing, but there's, there's, there's kind of something else I want to do. Like I, what, what was that podcast? What was the topic? What'd you do? Uh, self-publishing answers was a, a self-publishing themed podcast. It oh, was no, all about, okay. yeah, no, it was, it was a very much like a self-publishing podcast. It was advice, you know, things that we were learning. Uh, mm -hmm. the, we would interview guests occasionally we would do It's It's not, not entirely dissimilar from word slinger. Okay. Um, but with two hosts and um, a little different. But I had a radio background and I wanted to kind of use my gear and I wanted to kind of. <laughs> That's me. I, wanted, I, I started this just so I could use this mic. I know. Hey, man, I have one of those swing arms. It, and I used to use it in my studio, but uh, it, it's too. I don't want to leave that stuff out all the time. And yeah. I don't like you, man. I'm not going to break my set down and build it back up every time. It's a couple of lights, baby. Come on. <laughs> so, no, so I, I'm uh, legitimately one of the biggest reasons I started the podcast was so that I would have an excuse to talk to people who knew more than I did. That, that was exactly why I started yeah, mine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We even talked about that on, on my, when I interviewed you. Um, and it was, it was, there were other opportunities uh, I, th I thought might come of it. I thought I'd be able to sell books that way. That doesn't really pan mm -hmm. out. Um, yeah. The audience is, is different. Um, I wrote a book, a nonfiction book that I, that I did pimp on the show that did sell well, you know? So I, I think if I wanted to go that route, I could probably be very success successful with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a fiction guy. Uh, so the, uh, the thing was I, once I started, it just became an addiction. Um, we're in the, let's see, I started in 2013, so we're in like the fourth year of the show. Yeah, you've had how many of these things? Uh, I've got a hundred and, was it 125 episodes? I think that's right, yeah. Published, and then I've got, that's of, as of today, tomorrow it'll be one more, and uh, I've got, you know, probably a good 20 or 30 interviews already in the can for the next several episodes. How often do you release it? It's a once a week podcast, it's one hour. Mm -hmm. Um, the interviews are generally around 30 minutes. The, the rest of that hour is me, you know, to, to, maybe I read some reader emails or I'm sorry, but this is the perfect time for them to start putting carpet in, uh, right above me. <laughs> uh, see, that's what that knock. It's okay. Is. But, uh, you know, I, I, I built the show, uh, in such a way that it was a, not just an interview format, but also a chance for me to share, uh, in, you know, advice, um, mm -hmm. uh, to give people something to chew on. Um, and then, the, of course, there's the guests, and the guests are amazing. I mean, I haven't had a bad guest yet, really. <laughs> you know what? I, I, that is exactly the same thing that I did with interviewing authors, and we, we talked about this on your show. I, I started it basically because I was nosy, yeah, and I yeah. wanted to know how these guys were doing well, what, I, what I, you know, I wanted to do what they were doing. So, right. Did you, uh, have you read, I'm, I assume you've read Tim Ferriss's uh, Four Hour Work Week? I, I read it when it first came out, and I, I, God love Tim Ferriss. I I I I work twelve hours a day, no matter what. Right. So uh, right. that's that's really great in theory. I just never was able to do it. <laughs> well, so one of the things that I did take from it that I use consistently um, was the idea of the informational interview. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And 
I figured that if I was going to try to call someone up and interview them anyway, I might as well record that and I might as well leverage it for something else. Yeah. Yep. People are much more willing to talk to you. Uh, there's a much greater opportunity for them much and there's more in it for them. Yeah. If you have a platform that you can broadcast to, um, just calling them up and asking if they'll do an informational interview, they'll probably do it a lot of the time. But if you mm-hmm. can say, look, I've got a show, I've got 35,000 35, uh, downloads a week. I've got, you know, this is my platform. It goes out to several thousand people via social media. You know, I'd love to talk to you. Right. Um, you're going to, you're going to have a lot easier time. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, yeah, I was amazed at how receptive even, even some of the bigger names was. And then everybody and their mother wanted to come on. Yeah. Do you get that every week? You get a yeah, dozen get emails it. going, Hey, I, We're, I wrote a book on, you know, my dog was depressed. Will you interview me? Yeah, I get it. So, so when I first started the show, I, my biggest fear was I'm, I'm not going to have anybody to interview. I was <laughs> yeah. bringing in just buddies of mine yeah. for the first few episodes. Yeah. Same I'm like, here. I just want to make sure I have some episodes, you know? Um, but the reality is that once the show existed, I, I I, I, I will never have to, I mean, I reach out to people all the time because I just, you know, Hey, I'd like to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I just sat back and, uh, and chilled, I'd have interviews scheduled every day. Yeah. Uh, I actually have to be very, not selective. I don't, I don't necessarily tell people no, it just depends. But you, but you have to be, you cannot interview everybody. That's true. You know? I mean, yeah. your, your audience, I mean, that, that was my, my prerequisite and it still is for doing the interviews on this show um, is will my audience benefit from what my guest has to say? Right. You know, you don't right. necessarily have to be a, a New York times bestselling author. You might be a, a successful self publisher or you might be a yeah. time management expert, yeah. but that's, that's what it comes down to. But if, again, if you've, everybody and their mother can write a book. I mean, let's be right. honest with it and not everybody would be interested in it. So, you know, you're, you're much nicer than I am. I am. <laughs> I, you do have to be picky. You have to be selective, but I do so with the audience in mind. Well, so here's, here's my thing. I mean, uh, the show, you know, the tagline for the show is it's all about the story here, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The, the great thing about humanity is we are a collection of stories. This is one of the reasons why I love anthropology. It's one of the reasons why, you know, the, the, when I write about characters, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing little pieces of, you know, the stories that I've encountered in my life. It's another reason to do the show. Um, you know, everybody's got something worthwhile to share right. and inspiration can come from any, anywhere and anyone. Um, mm-hmm. It's not that I'll just interview everybody cause I've turned people down, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to- based on topic sometimes uh, based on, you know, I've got one guy who, who pings me every month cause I interviewed him <laughs> <laughs> several, you know, a couple of years ago, yeah. things every month, I've got a new book, I've got a new thing, I've got a new thing. And I'm like, this isn't about promoting your work. I mean, right. I, it is. Yeah. I want you to be able to do that. If you're on my show, you, and I told you this, man, you mm-hmm. know, it, I want you to promote something. I want you to promote something that's important to you, but I, I can't, it's not the, the monthly promote your thing show. It's right. You know, it has to resonate with the audience. Um, I've had some interviews that maybe weren't as well received. Um, but for the most part, man, it's been uncanny, no matter who I end up bringing on the show, they have just some insight mm-hmm. that is just so valuable. Um, my guests are the most incredible people I've ever met and I've gotten mm-hmm. so many opportunities. This, the opportunity with draft to digital came because of this show. So mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it, I don't recommend it for just anybody, but it's been fantastic for me. Well, I, I think also, but the, the thing there is Kevin, you're, you're good at, that you're good at the interview you're good at, at podcasting i see so Perfect. many yeah. I, I i see so many podcasts and video casts that are just horrific yeah and yeah. i'm i i think you and i do it better than most yeah. i'm patting myself on the back here but <laughs> uh, but that's the thing I'll to give, me I'll is give it to you man well okay. you know here's i here's the i don't really care who the guest is they're only as interested interesting as you the host make them Right. You know what I mean? You could right. have a David Baldacci on and Baldacci is, he's literally there to, to, to respond to your questions, not to ramble and share nuggets. Right. So uh, I think you do it really well. It's the word slinger podcast, a hundred and gosh, 25 ish episodes. Uh, is there a, a, a particular guest that stands out in your mind as memorable? I always tell people that my favorite 
interview to date was Andy Weir. Um, yeah, me too. Because <laughs> in you know this, I interviewed him like I interviewed him two months prior, and his interview went live one month prior to the release of the movie. Oh wow! Yeah, and uh, so there was great timing there, great synergy, and he was just a great guest all around. Yeah. I mean, he was uh, he was nice funny. Guy. You know, we had a whole conversation about Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing about Andy, he's probably the biggest nerd on the planet, but geez, yeah. he's he's really funny. Yeah, I interviewed him uh, when they were making the movie. And the thing that impressed me about Andy is, you know, uh, I'm like, well, tell me about the movie. And he was just so calm. And I'm like, Andy, I would be bouncing off the freaking walls yeah. if, if Matt Damon was going to be in my, and Andy's like, yeah, it's kind of cool. And I'm like, oh yeah. man, you're too yeah. low key, brother. <laughs> uh, let's segue into draft to digital because yeah. you just mentioned that tell the audience uh, for those that don't know what that is tell them what draft to digital is and what they do all right draft to digital uh, at its heart draft to digital is a publishing aggregator um, meaning that you can bring your manuscript to us and we'll distribute it to all the major players. And by bring it, you mean upload it. <clears throat> upload it, right. Yeah. So here's the deal. We have a, a ton of free sort resources for authors. We actually don't make any money off of the authors directly. Uh, so you can bring your Word document in. We'll convert it for free to a really lightweight, beautiful EPUB. Um, we are releasing some uh w w i don't know when this episode goes live how when, when are we going to go live when would you like this episode to go live? <laughs> well let's just say that if it goes live after tuesday of next week uh we will have introduced a uh, a new series of e epub templates okay you you let's assume that it has <clears throat> gone live go ahead all right so uh as of the as of the the week that this episode goes live i'm, I'm a, week, a week from tomorrow uh, Right. So we are, Draft to Digital has introduced a, uh, a series of EPUB templates uh, to, to sort of course go, they, they go side by side with our already recently updated uh, print layout templates. So what we've effectively done is created um, a service very much like Vellum that you can do, use for free. Uh, it's, it's operating system agnostic, meaning you can just, if you have access to a web browser, you can upload your manuscript, you get a free uh, conversion to EPUB and Mobi and PDF. You get a print ready PDF that you can take to CreateSpace or Ingram Spark or anyone else. Doesn't cost you a dime. All that layout is absolutely free. You can, and then we got some cool looking templates that you're going to be able to choose. So that's one of the, the free services. Universal Book Links was something we introduced uh, last year, which is to me, that is still to date the coolest thing that draft to digital has introduced to the world. It's a single link that you can customize that will allow you to, to uh, send your readers to everywhere your book is sold online from just one link. That's cool. Uh, yeah. It is it to me, it's one of the coolest things we've got. You can customize it. Like I say, I've got for every title I release, I have a custom URL. It's books to read.com slash, you know, Atlantis riddle, mm -hmm. you know, something along those lines. And so, what we've done is our commitment is we want to build resources that, uh, that let that will be author become a published successful author without having to spend a bunch of money on overhead. We, we try to do, we're, we're slowly introducing anything we can create that will help the author in that way. The only way we make money, we make, um, we take 15% uh, of royalty. So the only way we make money is if you distribute through us, mm -hmm we take a cut. You do not have to distribute through us to use these tools. <laughs> yeah. You can go direct. Uh, we have a lot of authors who use us to convert their manuscript and then go to KDP select. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we would love it if you stayed with us and distributed through us, right. but we get it mm -hmm. like get that. There's a strategy here, you know, and we want to help you in any way we can. So the, the reason by the way, so I started working with these guys uh, yeah. last year. Um, First of all, <laughs> I had a pretty lucrative uh, copywriting business and uh, my, my books were doing pretty well. Uh, I was doing pretty well. I didn't have to take a job with anybody. Uh, but when I approached these guys, it was because I wanted to do some marketing work for them. Initially, I, I wanted to just help them out with their marketing, mostly to connect with other people in the industry. Mm -hmm. And the, they, they had been paying attention to me on my podcast and other shows. Anytime I mentioned them, they, they knew it. 
I didn't know they were doing this. Uh, so they actually just asked, would you like to be the face of the company? Come represent us, do their marketing. Um, and I was very excited by that. So I came on board as a fan. Uh, I was already a fan of the, the company long before <laughs> the opportunity arose. And it's been a fantastic ride, man. I mean, these, these are truly the, the, these are the biggest hearts in the business. Like they, they, everything you, we have a Slack channel, everything we do in that Slack channel, everything, every discussion we have is how, how can we create something that is going to be so valuable for the author? You know, they, they just, they're going to explode. Like <laughs> we, <laughs> we basically want to blow up a bunch of author heads. Well, see, that's one thing that I think is so cool about draft to digital because Amazon seems to go out of their way to make our lives difficult. Right. Right. If you will, I, uh, you know, KENP 3.0 is, is hit the fan and everybody's kind of, freaking out because nobody right. knows what's what really is going on or what payments are and uh yeah amazon just seems to every now and then just go out of their way to run authors off but you know the my my books are on on draft to digital and you know basically you know you i i love it listening to you describe the service because you say yeah you bring it in and whether you you, you kind of make it sound like we got to come there oh, no. uh, it's, it's all it's all uh, well it, it's, all it, well, it, it's so easy though i mean basically it's as easy as uploading a cover uploading a file right. if you need some conversion service that's there and clicking a few buttons and all of a sudden you know my books are available on itunes right. kobu nook uh, gosh, how, what nine or ten different platforms yeah. now? And we're we're adding new platforms all the time. Yeah, yeah, and so I think when you, as an author, when you get to the point where you do go wide, and that means go wider other than just Amazon, right. um, I think Draft to Digital is a great platform to do it. I I endorse yeah. it because I use it. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, honestly, um, we've timed this. If you have your elements in already uh, set, you've got mm -hmm. a cover, you've got your manuscript, you've got your book description and it's just copy and paste, uh, you can literally go from uploading your manuscript to hitting publish in about 10 seconds. Yeah. And it's, it's, we did that intentionally. You know, we made, we streamlined that, uh, every chance we get, we tweak that to make, make things work better and make yeah. the, the conversion cleaner. Um, and we occasionally there are problems and the, here's the other great thing about draft to digital. That I always loved is when you do have a problem, you reach out to their support team, you can click on a button on the website. Uh, there's a phone number. There's an email address. There's a lot of ways to reach real live humans sitting in an office in Oklahoma City. Yeah, who are there specifically to solve your problem. Good, <laughs> good luck. Good luck doing that with Amazon. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay. Props to Amazon. This is props to Amazon time. Um, mm -hmm. Amazon invented the industry that is making me my money. Okay. Yep, they did. So, I'm very appreciative of what Amazon has built. That said, we all know Amazon does not have the author's best interests in mind. Now, they are, however, looking at the readers, the customers, and taking yeah. care of the customers. And that's yeah. where we need to keep our focus. We need to have that same mm -hmm. attitude, right? Yeah. Now, our specific customer at draft to digital is the author. So we take care of the author the same way Amazon takes care of the reader. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we're we're working on Amazon. We had Amazon as one of our distribution partners when we first started. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon is Amazon, though, and you know, yeah. it complicated things, and it, we couldn't keep it up. And yep, it's oh, it's like opening it's like opening a shop next door to Walmart. You know, as soon yeah. as Walmart starts doing what you do, you're out of business. So, well, it's not even like that. It wasn't. It wasn't. There's no competition between us and Amazon. The problem for for us with Amazon was that they have. Um, they try to automate all, all the in, uh, onboarding processes and everything. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they sense some sort of violation or some sort of problem, their, their response is sort of knee jerk. It's cut it off. Yeah. And when you have 35,000 plus authors and 120,000 plus books that you're managing through their service, something's going to go wrong on a regular basis. And yeah. it just became too, cumbersome for us to manage things manually. However, they've since introduced new ways to do things. We're in talks. We're, we're sniffing around. We're sniffing each other's butts. Basically. <laughs> and, uh, well, good, good for you. Just don't get anything on your nose because yeah. can't guarantee it's going to happen, but we sure are excited. about. I got talk. you. Uh, Kevin Tumlison, you are an author, a podcaster, the face of uh, draft to digital and what a face it is, my friend. Yeah. 
I grew it myself. You know, as faces go, that one's not <laughs> terribly bad. So uh, last bit of advice for, uh, for the audience, folks that are looking to write and market and sell their own books. The, uh, the, I mean, the stock advice I give everybody is you need to decide to, that you're, if you want to do this, it's all about sitting down and writing every single day. So set yourself with a word limit. It can be, you know, you hear crazy numbers, 9,000, 10,000, 20,000, you know, some 5,000 is kind of a common number. But even if you're only writing 500 words a day, make sure you sit down and write those words. Yeah. Uh, use the, the resources that are out there. Drafted is a fantastic resource. Whether you want to go wide or go exclusive to, to Amazon, it mm -hmm. really doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is we want to provide you with something that's, that's going to be useful yeah. and, and help your career. And then my final advice, really, um, everyone thinks of being an author as being a very solitary business. Uh, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. It, no author gets to do this work and succeed at it unless they're able to bring in some help from the outside. Yeah. And you've got guys like Andrew Lee, you've got guys like Tim here, you know, me, there's so many resources out there. Uh, reach out and ask questions and uh, ask for help because that's, that's how you get ahead. That's how you succeed. You know, and that's one of the, the good things about the internet is the, the interactivity and the ability to, yeah. to connect and meet folks online. So uh, Kevin, to find out more about you and your work, where do they go? You can find more about me if you go to kevintumlinson.com. Uh, that's all things Kevin. You can find the words on your podcast from there as well. I'm relaunching the, uh, I'm making a dedicated site for that wordslingerpodcast.com. So hopefully that will be going live soon. And for draft to digital, definitely check them out at draft number two digital.com. Uh, that's where, you know, you'll find all kinds of resources there. So definitely drop in. Cool beans. We will put links to all that below. Hey, buddy, it's been fun. Let's do it again. You got it, man. We, right. I, and I'm getting used to these like two podcasts a week with you. Hey, buddy, I'll talk anytime <laughs> you want. I'll even, I'll, I might even put on pants next exactly. time. Exactly. No, no pants. All right, buddy. Talk to you soon. Take care, man. <laughs>